Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the panelists for participating in what I think is going to be a timely and interesting discussion on brain research. Uh, during this panel, we will focus on the progress of the brain initiative, the patient role in the research of diseases and conditions like Alzheimer's, depression, Parkinson's, and migraine, and the challenges entailed in gaining ground against these and other neurobiological conditions. First, I want to get an update of where things stand and where we may find ourselves in the future, um, starting with Dr. Collins. <laughs> you lead an agency at the front lines of this research. Could you describe where you see brain research moving in the next five years and if there's some daunting challenges that researchers have to overcome? Well, first, I'm glad to be on this panel. A very interesting group of individuals who I'm sure are going to provide quite a diverse perspective on this critical issue of where we're going with brain research and its applications to try to prevent and treat disease. For NIH, this is a major area of investment. I'm going to say something about the Brain Initiative, which is a very focused effort, but should also put that in the context that that represents only about 8% of the total investments that NIH is making in neuroscience. Uh, through a variety of our institutes, uh, including the Neurology Institute, the Mental Health Institute, and, and about 12 others. But in terms of the Brain Initiative, this is now a project which is three years along, a very bold effort to try to understand how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do. Considering that each of those may have a thousand connections, uh, the scale of magnitude of trying to understand the functions of this most complicated structure in the known universe is pretty daunting. And the idea that we were willing to say three years ago that it's time uh, to launch an effort uh, to deduce answers to those questions was pretty bold. But I think we're on a pretty good path, admittedly, just three years into what is a 10-year effort scoped out to 2025. And let's be clear, we will not really understand the brain in 2025, <laughs> but we'll understand a heck of a lot more than we do right now. The challenge for brain research that this initiative tried to take on, and I should say this is a collaboration with NSF, and France Cordova is here and may want to say something about NSF's role in this, and also with DARPA, and it's an international effort, and we have important connections with various philanthropies like the Allen Brain Institute and Kavli. So it's a very much uh, multi-partner enterprise, as well it should be. What we're really trying to accomplish with this initiative is to develop and apply technologies that allow you to see in real time what is happening with brain circuits involving potentially hundreds of thousands of neurons. Over the course of the past many decades, we've learned how to study individual neurons and to see what happens when one of them fires or what neurotransmitter they release or respond to. And whole brain imaging has gotten increasingly sophisticated with PET scans and CT scans and MRIs and even things that use diffusion tensor MRIs that allow you to look, see the wiring diagram of the brain, which is the human connectome project. But the, era, the level of resolution that you really want to get to that would allow you to understand what's happening in circuits just hasn't been within our grasp. And plus, you not only want a static view, you want that fourth dimension of time. You want to see what's happening when the brain is doing something. How do we lay down a memory and retrieve it? Wouldn't that be nice to know? There are various theories about it, but I don't think we would really say we understand that. Uh, how do you interpret incoming information that's coming at you through your senses, uh, visual or whatever? How, how do you initiate a motor movement? And how does that actually successfully, most of the time, uh, lead to what you intended to do? These are fundamental questions. Now, the Brain Initiative is focused on, in the first five years, developing the kinds of technologies that we just didn't have before and applying them not just to the human, but also to organisms that have simpler brains and that are perhaps more readily possible to manipulate. So there's a lot going on in organisms as simple uh, as worms and zebrafish, but also a lot that's focused on how we get to humans. Just a couple of the things that have happened in the first two or three years. Uh, I think one that has us all pretty excited is this ability to take a full census of what the cells are that are in the brain. We've looked at them through the microscope. We've ground up chunks of brain and tried to say what kinds of things are there. The big advance now, and this is really quite a dramatic advance, is we can look cell by cell. Single cell biology has arrived. And it's arrived in a way that's having an influence on a lot of research, but particularly in the brain, which is so complicated. You really want to know what kinds of cells are there. So it is now possible with the mouse and with the human brain 
to begin to take that census. And because each of those single cells can be queried about what are you doing, uh, basically what genes are you using, uh, what proteins are you making, you can begin to build a picture of what are some of the functionalities in the brain that we really didn't know about before. So this idea of having a cell census of the brain, which started as a pilot, is now a full-scale effort uh, of the brain atlas, is going to be one of the early big successes of the enterprise. And we made some interesting discoveries. I don't know if you saw in the last week or so publication of a new cell type that seems to be unique to humans. You don't see it in rodents. Um, it's called a rose hip cell, and I had to go to Google to look up what a rose hip was and try to see whether it resembled anything like this particular cell, and I can't say it did. But I'm sure somebody thought this was a good analogy who probably has a rose garden. At any rate, it's a pretty interesting cell that looks like it has the properties to achieve connectivities that we didn't know about and maybe weren't really able to assess looking at simpler animals like rodents. So that's one thing. Another thing that's fun, and if I had a video, I would show you some of the technologies that are able now uh, to see in real time in a mouse that's walking around carrying out some sort of task, uh, the firing of thousands and thousands of neurons at one time. And you can see how that changes with activity and with learning, which is beginning to get into that fourth dimension of how the whole thing works in terms of a circuit that's carrying out a particular function. A lot of that, of course, primarily being done in model organisms, but with a big push now uh, to move this into non-invasive approaches that could be made for human applications. In terms of the human applications, I think one of the early things that will come out of this is a much better understanding of how deep brain stimulation can be successfully used. We also already know that in the case of Parkinson's disease, some individuals achieve really dramatic benefits uh, from this deep brain stimulation applied uh, to the subthalamic nucleus. But it's kind of like you're sticking a telephone pole into the brain. We don't really quite know what we're doing there, except empirically it works. Now some of the more recently developed versions of that, which have feedback loops that allow you to figure out not just what you're sending as far as a signal, but what the brain is telling you about where you landed, looks as if this could make this a lot more sophisticated. So those kinds of clinical applications, although they're not the main focus of the brain initiative, which is mostly a basic science effort and all the applications build on top of that, uh, it's making some really interesting insights already. Now, we knew when we made this 10-year plan back in 2015 uh, in a remarkable visionary group that was led by Corey Bargman and Bill Newsom that it would need to be refreshed because mm -hmm. nothing in an area that moves this fast is going to last for 10 years without a revision. So we're in the process now of doing so. We have a new working group that's hard at work. And by next summer, uh, summer of 2019, there will be a draft of what we might call Brain 2.0 which will be available for wide circulation, and we hope we'll get lots of input from people. And that will then guide us with where we want to go in the next step. So as you can tell, I'm excited about this. It is wonderful that the Congress also has seen this as a really important flagship project. And so it is supported by the 21st Century Cures Act for a 10-year period, which means there's some stability there in terms of the support. It has recruited I'm happy to say a lot of investigators, including a lot of young investigators, who would have probably worked on something else in the most recent round of grant awards. More than half of the principal investigators were engineers. And that's exactly what we had hoped would happen, bringing that kind of expertise into this field with all of the technology capabilities that they bring with them. So we're on a good path. Um, lots of challenges about how to handle the data. This is going to be a big data problem if there ever was one. Uh, again, we're determined to work across institutions and across the world to try to be sure we end up with a data access circumstance so that whatever we learn about this is available to all of the bright minds out there that could make best use of it. This is not supposed to be a closed shop. This is very much supposed to be a community enterprise. Well, and we'll circle back to uh, the Brain Initiative and uh, collaborations between the public and private sector. Um, but first, I wanted to um, run to Ms. Dumas. Uh, you bring the patient perspective uh, to this topic, specifically relating to migraines. Um, how can researchers and patients work together to increase awareness and the need for more research on conditions that are still not fully understood? I think the key words there are still not fully understood. And um, I'm here representing uh, the migraine community. And we are in the US about 38 million strong uh, worldwide, about a billion people. 
So if you look at each one of your tables, uh, at the other people there, about one in four people at the table will have migraine in their household. So it's incredibly prevalent. And it's also incredibly mysterious. So we don't have near the amount of research that we need to really be able to make progress on this. And it's highly disabling disease. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a genetic neurological disease that uh, disproportionately affects women, uh, but it affects women, men, and children, uh, and military vets disproportionately as well. Uh, and affects us in our most peak productive years. So you see me sitting here and I look pretty normal and I've lost a decade worth of days to migraine. I used to have attacks 25 out of 30 days a month holding down a corporate job. Not easy. And there are many, many other people who are dealing with the very same thing and who are struggling um, to really, you know, relate to their families, be good, good uh, parents, struggling to pay attention in school, struggling to be productive on the job. So as you talk about the Brain Initiative, we're very excited that it might hold some answers for the millions of people who are struggling with migraine out there and in desperate need of more research. So in terms of patients coming together with researchers to really tackle this, um, there are some very talented investigators in the field. Um, doctors, unfortunately, we don't have quite enough of them. For board certified headache specialists, there's one for every 85,000, or basically a Super Bowl dome full of people. Uh, and that's not nearly enough. So patients don't have access to these world leading specialists and these world leading specialists are uh, busy with so many other things. So we believe that some of the answers for migraine may actually come from adjacent fields and, and other areas and from big data uh, to help us make progress. Uh, we're trying to create a, an environment with our community, migraineagain.com and uh, the Migraine World Summit where people are uh, have a voice and are able to really articulate what it is uh, to live with migraine, what their greatest needs are, so that researchers can further focus things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lifestyle component to migraine. Uh, it affects our lifestyles, and there are many, many things that can trigger attacks and um, take a perfectly good day into a terrible one that is spent in a dark room. And so we're trying to enlighten uh, the researchers who are focused on this and work with them at the beginning of the process and at every stage of the process uh, to do research that is truly productive and life-changing. Dr. Fitzpatrick, oh, did I turn myself off? Um, Dr. Fitzpatrick, I, your foundation supports projects in the research around human cognition. I was wondering if you could describe some specific projects that have contributed to our understanding of the brain so far and where you see research moving in the future. Sure, thank you. And thank you, and I'm very happy to have followed Paula because she queued up very nicely some of the things that I want to say, but I'm honored to be here with all of you on this panel. Um, let me just start first by saying that the James S. McDonald Foundation's mission is to um, fund the acquisition of new knowledge and its responsible application. And so we take the responsible application aspect of this very seriously. So even when we're investing in very basic science research, we'd like to know that it's being tied to a real problem. And I think Paula brought up this real problem when she said, you know, that migraine is a mystery. And that's one of the things that we would say is like, well, what's underneath the mystery and how can we get at it, right? Um, neuroscience, unlike some other fields, is data and tool rich, but it's theory poor. And we really do not yet know how to stitch together all this wonderful information that we're gaining about single cells, about circuits, about networks. So one of the things that we've been very interested in is putting the brain back into the body and putting the body back into the world. Because that's actually what an organism does. It uses its brain to get around in the world. And so studying it in isolation of real meaningful behavior, of real rewards, of real incentives, and real challenges and problems that it has to solve, I think is often where our very analytical, laboratory-based science departs from the real problems that we're trying to solve. And so putting that together, 
I think is really a place that a small foundation, and we are a very small foundation compared to some of the other funders that are sitting at this on this podium, um, is where we're sort of facing our challenge. So a perfect example of some of the, so for doing that, what we're trying to do is pull together. We heard earlier today quite a bit about collaboration and about working across disciplines. So we are trying to bring together neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists, behavioral scientists, people who study things like social normative behavior, um, all the way up to what is to ecologists, mathematicians, statistical physicists, and trying to get these people in a room around a problem and give them enough time to generate a shared language and a shared understanding of the problem that they're working on so we can move beyond metaphor grabbing. Right? It's very nice to say the brain is an ecosystem or the brain is a complex system or the brain is something, right? But to move beyond that metaphor and to really use that to say, if you believe that, what do we have to be doing differently than what we're currently doing? That's where I feel we can push in a way because we're kind of low stakes. <laughs> right? We're sort of low stakes when it comes to this problem. We're not going to support you from cradle to grave. You know, we're going to do, um, you know, an incremental small amount of funding to you. So I think that's a role that we can play. And I'll just tell you about one project that I think is turning out to be very interesting. And it turned out, again, like this kind of question. So every one of us, or most of us, have probably been anesthetized at some point in our lives. I know somebody who has been anesthetized. How do we wake up? So the induction into anesthesia is an active process. Emergence from anesthesia is a passive process. How does the brain reboot following surgical anesthesia? How do all the systems come on back online? How do all of our memories wind up there? How do we reemerge with our sense of self totally intact, except for those times when anesthesia goes wrong and it doesn't? And that is a way of getting in to the network, circuit network ideas of the brain and taking it seriously. And so we are funding groups of anesthesiologists, practicing anesthesiologists, to work with neuroscientists, to work with mathematicians, to work with physicists, to work with engineers, to work with you know, ecosystem people, um, to really begin to think about what are we learning from network science and what, are we, what is the data that we can acquire from the millions of experiments that we do a day by put, making people surgically anesthetic um, and use that as a way in to thinking about this problem of how does the brain actually work? So that's all I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Dr. Breland Noble, um, I understand that your research looks at racial disparities and mental health. I was wondering if you could touch on how current brain research could better incorporate data about external social and environmental factors into clinical trials. Sure. So this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to get y'all ready because this is what I do um, <laughs> all the time, everywhere. So everybody knows I'm that like that kid in the back of the class. You're ready to go. And it's that curious, nerdy kid. He's like, but I have one more question. I'm like, mm -hmm. Right? That's sort of me. Talking about diversity and disparities. And so for me, um, I was really thinking about what you just shared about uh, the kind of research you're funding with all the different kinds of people at the table. And my first thought was, put some patients at the table. Um, and my second thought was, I can remember going through um, a situation with a loved one, someone I care about very deeply, uh, who every time he has to go under anesthesia, we all panic in our house. Because the worry is, given some of his physical complications, he's a Vietnam veteran, he's an African American man, um, he has issues with obesity. He has heart disease, right? So you hear all of these risk factors, right? But he's also a person who came through the civil rights movement. And so when we think about community and we think about difference and we think about diversity, we think about what are those traumatic experiences that have impacted him that may play a factor and what is that physical process like as he starts to come out of anesthesia. So for me, it's thinking about if I can reach all of the different kinds of people who may have to go under anesthesia 
and I can develop something that's relevant for all of them, then I'm developing something that can be widely used and widely applicable across populations. And so for me, that's the issue. When we talk about brain science, it is one thing to talk like we talk in the lab. It's something very different, right? We call it code switching. I'm a Howard University grad. That's what we learned in undergrad. I was an English major. Code switching. So you talk one way, right? You talk one way in front of grandma, right? You talk a different way in front of your friends. You talk a different way in front of mom and dad. I think we have to do the same thing when we communicate about brain science to patients and populations. So I think part of why I was invited um, it's because I was with some Research America colleagues. I have to thank them deeply. Uh, we did an event with Corey and a couple other fun, uh, funders a few months ago. And all I talked about, I was sort of jumping up and down on the table, was about representation matters. Everybody matters. And so when we think about these issues of community, when we think about social and behavioral issues. I'm a depression expert. Uh, that's what my training is in. My training is from Duke in the Department of Psychiatry, where I learned about clinical trials. You know, the, one of the things that I know is science is good. It's better when it's applicable, right? It's better when we can translate it to people who look like us, smell like us, talk like us, feel like us. And so as I look around this room, I see all kinds of people. And my goal and my hope is that with, with the brain research that we do, that everybody feels like they can see themselves as a part of that science. So when I go out and talk, I, I can't talk to people just about, with, uh, just about clinical terms. I have to talk to them in real language. So I can't just talk about signs and symptoms of depression. I have to talk about what that looks like in Big Mama, right? If Big Mama's asleep in the back room and she doesn't come out, she only comes out once a day, well, maybe she does have depression. And so when I think about how we can translate these issues, how do we create science? How do we help build a, a scientific base that's going to be applicable to everybody? I'm always thinking about collaboration. What does collaboration need to look like? So what I always say to people, I had an interview about this yesterday, and they asked me, you know, everybody calls me Dr. Alfie because I work with kids, and Breland Noble is too much to say. So they just say <laughs> Dr. Alfie, and it's easy. Um, they said, well, you know, if you had one wish uh, for the kind of science that you do and for other scientists to help really create a stronger research base and, and stronger interventions and treatments for uh, racially diverse populations, what would it be? And one of the things I said is, I would really, really, my dream would be that the people in leadership on these research studies, the principal investigators and, and the like, would look like the people they're trying to serve, right? So they don't, it doesn't have to, I'm not talking about racial matching. I'm just saying like for my research lab, I have a young woman who's Middle Eastern. I've had many Asian American young women, right? I work with black kids primarily and Latino kids. Everybody does not need to be black and Latino, but what's important is that the young people see that there are lots of different kinds of people who want to help them. That's the key, which means we have to have lots of different kinds of principal investigators beyond the entry level awards, you know, going on to mid career and senior career. That's my dream. And so I think in direct response to your question, how I think brain science can really be helpful and what the issues are that are relevant from a social, behavioral and community perspective, um, is that you know, we really want to be able to create science and create an approach to science, developing science, translating science that really speaks to the needs of people's lived experience. And so we have to have that voice at the table to be able to do that. Thank you. Sure. And you know, I've been hearing a lot so far about bringing different areas of research together and really sharing information. And um, Dr. Cordova, um, you know, this is my understanding of the Science Foundation. Is it really does bring different areas of science together to understand the brain. Um, and I understand the foundation is working to develop tools to increase our understanding of the brain's structure and function. Um, are there particular brain science technologies the uh, foundation is currently investigating? Um, well, thank you for the question, and uh, let me start with just emphasizing what, what you said in those, uh, that introduction, that the National Science Foundation funds all science and engineering, except for perhaps biomedical science directly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the integration of all these different disciplines is just essential to the way we function. And I heard so many interesting things going along the panel thus far about the different aspects that we try to all bring together, whether it's the social behavioral aspect and how important that is in developing true theory of cognitive science, or uh, the computer 
um, and integrate with all the big data that's available and integrating that into to networks of information that are accessible and open, transparent to everybody. Uh, the physics and, and, and chemistry uh, approaches to understanding the brain and, and engineers that are needed in the Capital Brain Initiative on neurotechnologies. And so, uh, so we're constantly trying to develop programs that are integrative and that bring all these people together to the table in the convergent sense that's been talked about here in order to make progress. So the, the brain, let me um, uh, take myself back to my own graduate student days and I, as an astrophysicist, that um, it was the, the a new universe was opened up uh, for completely new understandings when there was a focus on uh, the technologies that physicists and engineers had developed in other forms of science, uh, specifically with particle accelerators and, and microscopes and all that. They, they turned those microscopes outwards into uh, reflecting telescopes for x-rays and pinhole cameras and gamma ray detectors and so on to have the potential of observing above the atmosphere that absorbs everything. So there's a whole universe that was not, is not seen from Earth because of the Earth's absorbing, absorbing atmosphere. And so once we, they, there was an emphasis on developing those technologies, putting them first into rockets and then later satellites, we discovered phenomena that were completely unknown. Phenomena like black holes and neutron stars and and dark matter and dark energy and so forth that actually comprises uh, the 96 percent of the mass energy of the universe. So what we actually see, you and me and and the physicalness of this room, is just a tiny, tiny fraction of what's out there. So I think of this this new way of approaching the brain and. Um, and a focus, a special focus on the technology aspects of it as being able to also open up whole new windows into the behavior of, uh, of the brain and its chemical and physical uh, pathways and so on. And, and so I, I, we are seeing, and as Francis said, it's just uh, you know, a few years old uh, uh, initiative, but, but we're seeing all sorts of people drawing into this field to approach the most complex organ that we know of in the universe thus far, um, and uh, and it will certainly be revealing uh, all sorts of uh, new and unimaginable things. So I also, when when I was an undergraduate student, I was uh, an English major, and so I, I have to bring Emily Dickinson into this <laughs> picture, and 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 she said that the brain is wider than the sky for when you put them side by side, the one the other will embrace. And, and that's how, um, how we also look at this, that the brain is capable of doing much more capable of thinking and learning and action is capable of pain and suffering and the kinds of things that we've heard about up here. And so, under, so bringing all these people together, as well as the technologies to make uh, the difference is, is just, uh, this is a new moment for the brain. And, and I, I think we're all very lucky to be working together in partnership. And I, I want to thank all of you for being great partners. And I particularly want to single out Research America. And I, when I see all those exclamation points behind me, I think every one of them is one of Mary Woolley's newsletters that is <laughs> so excited about some new aspect of something new that's going on that is driving us to action and, and to have hope, which is a button that Francis Collins always wears because that's um, what it's all about. So just um, it, to very, very uh, briefly answer your specific question about what new things, let me, let me just call out a couple of examples that I think we're very excited about. One is a program called Neuronex, and I know there are some people in the room that are involved in that, that have uh, some of our 17 new awards. To do. It's to develop shared capability and resources, as well as theoretical frameworks and computational modeling. And what we're trying to do with Neuronex is advance a national research infrastructure mm -hmm. for all the information and the data that we have on the brain, whether it's in theory or, or practice. 
Um, another program uh, that we have is called Clarity, which is a revolutionary imaging technology that provides unprecedented 3D views of an intact brain's neural structure and internal connections. And it allows researchers to see neural structure while keeping the brain intact. And I'll close my remarks by uh, something that I um, uh, uh, kind of knew um, discovery piece of research that's out there where um, people are working on traumatic brain uh, injury and and that was uh, mentioned here and things that are similar to there. NSF funded researchers have produced in an in vitro model of traumatic brain injury using a microfabricated chip combined with brain tissue cultures and they call it a brain on a chip model and that's to assist us in understanding the condition and the search for new treatments. And we, we all know how, uh, what a debilitating kind of illness that is. But they're actually doing just right on little micro slides, putting tissue culture and getting the hippocampus to talk with uh, other tissues and materials and see where the synapses and where the connections are made and how they cross over into each other and studying that. And it's just thrilling to see these uh, pieces of research all trying to explore better how it is that we do what the sky, the inert uh, sky, uh, cannot do, which is to, to think and learn and to feel. And uh, so again, I just think it's a remarkable time to be putting all these um, different disciplines together in an integrative way to make progress. Thank you. And to continue on this theme of collaboration, um, Dr. Manji, your work focuses on delivering medicines on disorders such as schizophrenia and Alzheimer's, and you also bring experience from the public sector as well. I was hoping you could discuss the respective roles of the public sector and the private sector in partnerships that seek to speed innovation. Sure, thank you. First, first I'd like to thank Research America. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mary, and others. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this, this distinguished panel. Um, as you alluded to before I joined Janssen, where I presently am, I actually had the pleasure and privilege of being at the NIH intramural program for 15 years, so kind of seeing, you know, both sides. And I think it almost goes without saying from every comment you heard, you know, nothing is more complex than what we're trying to do. Certainly from a biologic standpoint, you heard about you know, the most complex organism there is with the billions of neurons talking to each other. Certainly from a societal aspect, you know, we're not isolated neurons in the dish, although we have to start there. Our racial, our ethnic, our societal background impact on it. I heard a statement at a meeting that really got me saying that in the U.S., perhaps our zip code is a bigger determinant of our health than our genetic code. Now, it may not be absolutely true, but it tells you that you can't study neurons in isolation, etc. And I think, you know, and again, you know, hearing some of the earlier panels, you know, some outstanding work going on, so it's not a matter of saying neuroscience is more important than oncology, is more important than infectious disease, etc. But I think most of us would agree that we're dealing with some of humanity's most devastating conditions. You've heard about Alzheimer's, the, in what people call impending tsunami with our aging population. The serious mental illnesses strike individuals when they're relatively young and they're lifelong, so that they're the chronic disease of the young. So we have to come together as a society to tackle these big problems. And I think we have many precedents in the semiconductor industry, IMEC and Semitech, what we collectively were able to do in HIV AIDS, now that's being done in neuroscience, and there's many places where public-private partnerships can work. One good example is talking to Dr. Collins just before we started. They're launching some initiatives. One of them is something called the AMP, which is really trying to look at ways we can work together to advance our understanding of conditions like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, etc. In Europe, there's an organization called IMI, Innovative Medicines Initiative. Now we're coming together to have people work together so you can bring different thoughts, different perspectives, different resources. One of the other things that the NIH had done was a program called iSpy2, which is a breast cancer initiative where the idea was, can we actually study multiple treatments in a similar cohort, use biomarkers to decide who responds to what? So multiple companies, NIH, et cetera, did that. A similar endeavor is occurring in neuroscience with something called EPAD, the early prevention of dementia, where again the idea is that, you know, let's not do a one and done, let's work together to try and advance things. I think the area of biomarkers, so the foundation for the NIH, 
has had a lot of successes. One of them is in this field of Alzheimer's called ADME, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. There the concept is that we, it's almost unquestionable that by the time someone gets a diagnosis, the illness has been cooking in the brain for 15 or 20 years, how do we actually identify who's on that trajectory? And it's the sort of problem you couldn't have done in isolation, but by coming together, companies, governments, FDA, et cetera, you can tackle this problem. And the last thing I'll mention in this realm is that I, I would really emphasize basic science and tools and technologies. You know, I think correctly when we have these huge clinical problems, we focus a lot on translational research, which we need, but you cannot underestimate the importance of basic science knowledge and tools and technology, which often provide the wherewithal to make an impact. I'll just give you one example and then turn it back to you. So I remember when I was at the NIH, sometimes the NIH was being criticized. You know, you're the National Institute of Health. Why are you funding studies on the songbird brain? And we now know that human neurogenesis, the formation of new nerve cells, in part we have made progress by studies on the songbird brain. So I think there's a lot of reasons to do this public-private work. We each have our own, you know, strength and at different stages of the development path will have a bigger role. But that's the only way we're going to make a big difference for these devastating conditions. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for really uh, bringing up several points that I really want to turn back to and, and dig into. But um, first, I wanted to throw rather a broad question at all of you, which is, you know, with so many areas um, in need of research, um, how do we prioritize? Well, NIH is fortunate, uh, thanks to especially the last three years of congressional support uh, that our financial resources have now climbed up to $37 billion a year, which means that we have the opportunity to fund across a very broad range from basic to clinical, and about half of what we support is basic and about half is applied. But we do still have big challenges in figuring out how to set priorities. If you're a really smart, capable scientist or working in biomedicine somewhere in a university across the country, and you send us your best ideas in a grant application, uh, your chance of getting funded is about 20%. Now, that's better than it was four years ago when it was about 16%. Uh, but it is not really in a healthy place, uh, which uh, we look back uh, 20 years ago uh, to when it was more like one out of three, maybe 30 35%. So we know we're leaving good science on the table. For us at NIH, the main way we set priorities is by expecting the entire scientific community, from the most basic scientists who may be working on roundworms or bacteria to people who are running a clinical trial, and everything in between, health disparities, all of the things that we need to understand about social and behavioral science, we count on them to have those great ideas and to send them in. And then we put them through the most rigorous peer review system in the world. Not to say that it's perfect, and we're always trying to make it better, but it's pretty darn good. And see what actually comes through by the opinions of experts in the same field. That's the majority of what we support. But at the same time, you can sometimes see that there are areas of research that are ripe for further advances that probably no single investigator is going to be positioned to be able to take on. The brain initiative could not be done by a single investigator. You kind of need to create a critical mass, and that means having a big, bold plan that people will say, hey, I want to be part of that, and will come and join in, like we did with the Genome Project 25 years ago, and like is now happening with brain. And that's where NIH has to have the right inputs, the right advice from all of our wise advisors on our advisory councils to see when one of those moments has arrived and make sure that we hit it at just the right moment. We have the Common Fund at NIH, which helps with that, because if you've got a bold initiative that doesn't really fit neatly into one of our 27 institutes and centers, but if it worked, it might be really enormously important. Uh, the Common Fund is in that space. Uh, we were talking uh, just uh, yesterday about gene editing for therapeutic purposes. If you're watching that field, you can't help but be pretty carried away by the way in which just a short number of years uh, with CRISPR-Cas and other kinds of gene editing have come along, that we might be on a pathway towards the ability to treat those 7,000 genetic diseases where you know the DNA misspelling with a targeted approach, starting with sickle cell disease and going all down that very long list of people who are waiting and for whom there isn't going to be 
a one at a time kind of approach that will get there anytime soon. But this might actually be scalable. If you could do in vivo gene editing with appropriate delivery, maybe it's a virus, maybe it's a nanoparticle to the right tissue, deliver the Cas9, deliver the guide RNA, fix the mutation. And we're talking about the brain, so let's be clear. Of those 7,000 diseases, more than half of them are diseases of the brain, and many of them affect children. Without, whom, uh, without this kind of thing, there's not going to be much hope. That's the kind of thing. And I can look at that and go, okay, so we just put in $160 million into a common fund project to try to bring more people into that question of how do you do the in vivo delivery of something like gene editing. It's a complicated process. Whenever the institute directors sit around the table, which we did this morning for, for two hours, and we do almost every Thursday, this is what we talk about. Are we getting our priorities right? <laughs> is there something that we're missing here? Is there something that we're doing that actually is turning out not to be as productive as we thought, and we need to scale that back, which is always harder than starting something new, but it's part of the job, too. Uh, it looks like you had something to say, Dr. Cordova. Yeah, I, I would definitely uh, underscore everything that Francis has said and then add, add two things. One is I know there are representatives from the National Academy uh, in the room, like Victor Sal, uh, who heads the Institute of Medicine. And the, uh, the reports of the National Academies, and uh, in particular for us, they're decadal reports every 10 years when they do set priorities that the whole community comes together, are just hugely important in helping us to, uh, to come out with a list of priorities. Um, and then uh, the, the other uh, thing that I wanted to elaborate is that the, this aspect that Francis is, even the very first Senate hearing that we had together one month after mm -hmm. I, I came in almost five years ago, um, and that question, your question, Aaron, was asked by a senator, and Francis talked about the top-down and bottom-up approaches and, and where they meet and how important they were. So on the top uh, top uh, down, I wanted to underscore the importance of bold new initiatives and ideas. Mm -hmm. And those they actually, they do filter up, they trickle up from the community, but it's, it's up to the agency, and in our case, we're fortunate to have the National Science Board, and I see people here like Alan Leshner, former uh, member of the National Science Board, who, um, who encourage us in this kind of behavior, and, uh, uh, and, and that's more seeing where you know, where the needle is moving and what are the big themes that are going to grab the public consciousness and indeed worldwide attention. And uh, so, so NSF following that course adopted these 10 big ideas for future investment about two years ago. And it's just pro been uh, proven to be an enormously successful, just like the BRAIN initiative has in setting our directions for the future and galvanizing people. So actually the BRAIN initiative falls under one of those big ideas called rules of life. Because we, we, we have the genome now and thanks to Francis and, and many, many others, um, we can now uh, decode the genome and we know a lot about the, the epigenome and the environment of the genome, but we don't know how to predict phenotype. And that's in the brain is just we don't know how you get from the genome and its environment to um, to the brain. And so so I, priority setting is, uh, is something that, as Francis just said, it needs the constant attention of all hands internally, but also externally, the ideas that come from the community. So I'll uh, just end with saying one of our big ideas is called NSF 2026. And that's everybody's opportunity in this room because it was just announced. It's a, a nationwide competition for new big ideas. So you too, if you're 14 or over, it turns out if you're under 14, <laughs> there are laws uh, uh, about that. So you have to give it to Big Brother system about suggesting the big ideas for NSF to take hold of. And we're looking for big, powerful things. And we're hoping by the year 2026, which is our nation's sister centennial or 250th birthday, that we are um, that we have other big ideas like the Brain Initiative, like Rules of Life, to um, move us forward. If I could just add something, so clearly okay. everything um, Dr. Collins and Dr. Cordova mentioned is completely accurate. One other thing is I think they're both actually really championing is the idea of data sharing. So clearly, you know, some of these are distinct areas of diseases, disorders, but often there's more overlap than we sometimes realize. And by trying to have the data go together, insights can come out of it. 
one of the things that was recently launched is something called a Dementia Discovery Fund that Bill Gates actually joined and trying to make data sharing and looking at data across diseases and disorders become a little bit more available. It allows us in a time of you know, reduced resources to get insights so that we can make traction in other areas as well. So I do think that's one of the things as a society, you know, it's an easy, it's more work for investigators, etc. But the more we can sort of um, incentivize that, the better off society will be. And Dr. Fitzpatrick. Yeah, so, so thinking about it from, from a philanthropic perspective, um, philanthropy is kind of under uh, a dual pressure to some extent, right? You have your own priority setting. Um, what can you do with the limited resources that you have? What are the opportunities we can, that, that you might be able to pursue? And how do you set those priorities? Versus, and then you have this other pressure, which is increasing, which is the idea that we're supposed to be a partnering with everybody, right? And, and getting on board with someone else's agenda so that we can move something forward. So how, how can you, how do you adjudicate those, those pressures? And I think this, you know, there, there's, to me, what I love about, about philanthropy is that it rep represents a distributed decision making. So while we have these top-down national initiatives that can really push forward because they have much bigger resources, um, what philanthropy, I think, can, can bring to this discussion is keeping those um, alternative hypotheses or sometimes a slightly heterodox idea going, right? Because if the dominant hypothesis, if the big idea um, falls a little bit short, you can't just ramp up a new idea, right? You, you have to allow these alternative ideas to also be sustained. And I think this can be not the sole role, but a role for philanthropy in keeping these um, maybe slightly off center, or you, know, you turn your gaze 10 degrees, and you keep those enterprises going so that if, because you just don't know what's going to happen where, where you place your chips. And again, as I said earlier, we're kind of low stakes, right? It'd be one thing for the NIH or the NSF to put all of its eggs in one basket, right? And where we can sometimes pick those baskets. We may not want one basket. We could have two or three baskets that we kind of keep going. And so I think um, from a priority setting, I think sometimes it's, it's not good to be pressuring private foundations and the disease advocacy organizations to always be getting in line. I think sometimes they should be able to march you know, to their own vision as long as we're transparent and sharing that information and keeping everybody in, in the same loop. Because otherwise, there are, I think, particularly populations that get left behind because they, they're often not being represented. Um, and I wanted to move on to a question about how researchers can most effectively communicate the value of their research. And um, I actually wanted to uh, maybe throw this to Dr. Breland Noble or Ms. Moss about communicating um, you know, areas of need. Uh, Sure. So one thing I think we want to be knowledgeable of, and I'll say this as someone who spent 20 years, uh, 15 in sort of the biomedical research space, clinical research space, and I think there are multiple ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. right? There's not one way, going back to what my colleagues said here. So when we think about one way of knowing, the scientists, I think we forget that everybody does not know the way that we know. Um, and so I think in terms of communicating, what's been important for me it's recognizing that there's value that I bring to the table. But there's also value that my community members, I do a lot of community-engaged research, community-based participatory research, mixed methods research, right? So I have to, I feel like I have to say my, my bona fides in front of this group. I have a <coughs> master's degree in health sciences from Duke, the medical school. Dr. Zal was there when I was there. And you know, part of what's important to me is helping people understand that if you value a different way of knowing that's not sort of mainstream, it does not mean that what you value is less valuable than what's mainstream. So it's really important to me to recognize that and acknowledge that because when I'm with community members, when I'm with patients, when I'm with people who don't really sort of wear their hat as scientists, um, 
They don't want to hear me talk in those sort of scientific ways. There's a different way that I have to communicate. It's not a less valuable way. It's not a less intelligent way. It's just a different way. So going back to the example I gave earlier, if I'm going to talk about um, clinical trials, then I have to talk in communities, talk with patients about what does it mean to be in a clinical trial? What is the value of you participating in a clinical trial? What are you bringing to that clinical trial? So I have to say stuff and share stories like my father and I went to, he was going to have eye surgery and the surgeon came to us and talked to us about the procedure that he was going to do. And the first thing I said, like a true scientist, show me the data. Who did you test this? Who has this been tested on? He showed it to me and sure enough, 2% of the sample was black. And I thought, well, so you want to do this with my dad? And there's no one in the sample who looks like my dad. Like, you have to explain to me why I should be okay with this. And so I think we can help. You know, I was one of those kind of pain in the neck, you know, patient advocates for my father. This is my dad. Um, and so, and I love my dad. And so I think being able to communicate in a way, in, in the physician, actually, in that case, he got defensive. He was angry. Um, and I don't think that's the way you're supposed to handle that. So I've had <laughs> patients come to me, right? I have patients grill me the first time they sit down with me in clinic. And I feel like what I have to do is recognize, in my case, it's a mental health situation always. And so in, one, in, in the first case, they're in pain. I have to recognize that they're coming to me in various states of pain. And so the questions are not coming from a place of anger. The questions are coming from a place of I need to understand because I need to know if you can help me stop this pain that I'm feeling. And so I think if I can always put in context when I communicate who's in the audience, what is it that they want to know, and what is it that I can give them to help them know in a way that feels relevant for them, I think that that's an issue. So the final, I think that's the way to handle it. So the final thing I'll say is that often for you know older scientists like myself, um, I look at some of my young colleagues. I know, I know it's all relative, trust me, it's all relative, it's all real. I got stories. Um, but when I look at some of my colleagues and they're on Twitter, right? They're, I'm going to say it, they're on social media talking about their work. I'm thinking, at first, why are they wasting time? How are they going to get tenure on Twitter all the time? Well, they're communicating to a population, right? And I, I can't name how many times I've been called to be an expert on television, on legitimate news places because they saw me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be able to communicate in different ways than I think we might have been trained to communicate. Because you, I mean, for me, ultimately, you know, my thing is, my mantra is I want young people to have the greatest opportunity for optimal mental health. And my young people are not coming to this, these kinds of meetings. The young people I want to reach are out there. And so I have to have a way to be out there and reach them. Yeah, I would add that, um, that social ethnography does give you a wealth of insight about what patients actually need. And to look at a problem from a scientific standpoint and to write a grant proposal for that without consulting the patient population is just a missed opportunity because it will be richer and more on target and more practical in its application once it comes to fruition if you get that voice at an earlier stage. I find that um, the doctors and researchers who we work with, um, many of them also have migraine, which is why they've gone into the field, and they bring their own personal insight into it. And those who are uh, still practicing clinicians and not just researchers get information from their patients. But there's a lot of work that could be done to involve patients at a much earlier stage. And even when you're considering what, what grants do I fund and don't I fund, you know, where is the voice of, of the patient in that? So it will we'll get closer to the target of what we need if we get back to the source of the people who need it. Thank you. Um, and now I wanted to turn uh, back to the brain initiative, which we heard Dr. Collins uh, talk about earlier, a uh, lot of excitement. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, if there's anything that's going under the radar uh, with this effort um, that we should be excited about or looking out for? Well, after just talking about communication, I hope we're not too under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually to try to tell everybody what we're up to. And um, One of the things I do in that regard, just to give a quick advertisement, is a blog that I write every Tuesday and every Thursday. If you're not aware of it on the NIH director's homepage, uh, you can see that. And a lot of it's about neuroscience now because there's so much going on. And yes, I do have 22,000 Twitter followers, and I tell them stuff about brain as well. But enough of me. Um, in terms of things going on under the radar, 
You know, I, I think one of the things that is increasingly catching public attention, and it should, and it was actually on the front page of the Post uh, last weekend, is the whole area of neuroethics. Uh, France talked about this ability, for instance, uh, to put many organoids of uh, brain tissue on a chip um, and increasingly, in a sophisticated way, begin to understand how the brain works in a, in a tractable system without doing invasive studies on people. So one can take these days uh, these induced pluripotent stem cells and uh, apply an appropriate uh, kind of cocktail of growth factors and have them turn into neurons and even groups of neurons, and even occasionally things in a Petri dish that start to have layers that looks like something like a brain. So at what point have we crossed a line, though, into something that deserves really serious consideration about its potential of having consciousness or having the ability to feel pain? Uh, those are important questions. When we think about trying to understand how the human brain is different from, say, the mouse or the rat brain, one idea is, well, take some human stem cells and inject them into the brain of another species, see if they'll take up residence there, and if so, whether they can function. Well, now, wait a minute. What's that rat or mouse thinking now? Are they uh, actually wishing that they could do some poetry? Or is there something happening there that we want to really consider in terms of what does it mean to be human when you start making chimeras like that? Now, these are intensely interesting and complicated topics. Uh, in our group right now that is planning Brain 2.0, there is a, a subgroup uh, that is specifically focused on neuroethics with patients, with, with ethicists, with scientists of various kinds of descriptors, um, and to really try to give us some advice, what are the areas that we ought to think about really not going to? And there's times where that's the right answer, but you want to be sure you're on firm ground. A lot of what's happened in neuroethics so far has been to kind of think of the craziest, wildest, most unbelievable science fiction uh, kind of scenario and then obsess about that. And that's not helping very much. I think we really want to say, what is practical in the next five years that we could do? And certainly these brain organoids would be one of them. And what do we want to think about in terms of limits that we set that we don't want to go across certain lines? Maybe that's a little under the radar, but it's about to become a lot more visible, <laughs> and it should be. Uh, and this is, boy, if you want a topic where there ought to be general public discussion, guided by reality, not by scary stories that are never going to happen, this is one of them. Thank you. And uh, before we uh, turn to audience q and I did want to fit in one question about some of the challenges uh, researchers are facing with clinical trials. Um, at this time, uh, many researchers have expressed difficulty in recruiting patients for clinical trials involving neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. In your opinion, what can researchers do in order to overcome this challenge? And I was um, hoping to start with Dr. Manji. Okay, great, thanks. And I think in some ways it builds off the comments you just heard, because I do think we need to take this on, again, as a societal um, issue, so to speak, where communication about the importance, you know, I think if we could elevate brain health to this level of heart health, you know, caring and knowing about your brain, and then you'd be sort of taking some ownership, you'd start to realize, you know, when potentially things might not be as good as they should be, when you might start to, you know, reach out to research, um, I think we you know what Dr. Alfie was mentioning you know, earlier. I hope you don't mind, <laughs> nope, Dr. Alfie. Not at all. Um, That's um, my thing. You know, sort of, especially with minority populations, I think for some very appropriate reasons from the historical past, there is a little bit more of a trepidation. You can't just post something and hope for the best. You've got to reach out to the community. So, what we've tended to do is often work with um, church elders or individuals with the Hispanic community to reach people there where they are and try and explain to them. One of the things that I may be biased from my you know, time at the NIH, but I think research is so important, not only to help humanity broadly, but in my opinion, by and large, you individually gain a lot. It may be from the you know, wonder drug that is being tested or the wonder, inter wonder intervention, but also you get a more comprehensive evaluation, a more thorough treatment plan, et cetera. So I think that would be, you know, in my humble opinion, you know, educating society about the benefits and them taking ownership, as you heard in the case of migraine and others, it shouldn't be us doing things to them. It should be with them at the table, realizing this can help me, my loved ones, and humanity. And then the last thing, coming back to what we started this discussion about in terms of public-private partnership, 
I think we also need to do a better job at not trying to do it all individually. You know, in some cases, there need not be 40 different trials on the same sort of pathway, et cetera. The more we can coordinate things, like I said, the iSpy2 did or something like that, then we can even have the sort of um, pool of patients who are amenable to research actually sort of answer even broader questions, help themselves and help humanity. So it's not a trivial undertaking, but I think if we work collectively as a society, we can really make a difference. Would anyone want to? I'd chime in. Um, I would just say that um, building on what you said about the family, uh, many of the people who are dealing with difficult disorders like uh, migraine or like my mother has Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. as do many other family members, uh, the ability to participate in, in trials and do something is very, very uh, difficult because you have to give up other medications and do other things or you don't have the awareness. But to the extent that you have the ability, I think the opportunity to appeal to do it for your family, especially if it's a genetic disease or disorder, is going to be passed on to your kids. I do not want my life with migraine to be repeated in my children or my grandchildren. That is my greatest motivation for participating in a clinical trial. Not because it's going to help me, but because it's going to help them. And so I think if you make it a, a selfless, generational, family kind of appeal, there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I also think, though, that we have to be careful about recognizing the fact that enrolling in clinical trials can be very onerous for, for patients, particularly people who are suffering from neurological and mental health disorders. Um, and so I think we on the scientific community side of this need to make certain that when we're bringing something to a clinical trial, we, have, we are relying on um, very valid preclinical data um, and are very careful about um, the, the background research that has been done. The number of failed clinical trials in neurological disorders is astounding. And I think we do have to take uh, a lens to the preclinical data that led into making the decision to bring that drug into a clinical trial. So I think um, that's, that's a, re you know, not to, not to be negative, but I think this is a reality that we have to be honest about. I don't know if I could in good conscience um, advise a family member or a close friend to enroll in a neurological disease trial right now. Um, with that, ooh, with that, I wanted to uh, open up the panel to uh, audience Q and A, and there should be roving mics. Um, right. First, I just want to say this was an excellent panel, and I really commend all the speakers. You made many, many great points, uh, and it's heartening to hear that we're up to thirty-seven billion dollars. But my question goes like this. Are we doing enough? Uh, I've been through this for years now, uh, and I've seen times when the Congress was very complaining and saying, where the hell are the answers and show us something you are accomplishing. I can tell you from directly working with patients, uh, many of them are frustrated by the fact that research takes so slow. So my question would be, what can we imagine that could make the cumulative effort between public and private, both sides, better, stronger, how are we doing with regard to what other countries are starting to do? There's an impression that some countries are starting to make some major investments. Are we there? 20% is fine. I don't think 20% is enough. If there are a lot of young scientists who are good, creative, and we're not giving them help, we're making a mistake. I happen to be involved in several of the private organizations outside. I see what the private sector can do when you get people motivated to do it. Can we increase that passion and spread it wider and get even more involvement for the private, from the private community or private-public partnerships? So anything you can think of, what should we do to make what have been heroic efforts by so many on this panel and their, and their colleagues even greater? Well, you mentioned public-private partnerships, and since you're sitting next to Michael Dulston, I have to point out that we have, in fact, I think, learned a lot from that model. Michael and I have co-led the executive committee along with uh, other experts uh, for this Accelerating Medicines Partnership on Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, now Parkinson's disease, a separate entity focused on cancer immunotherapy. 
Those have been great examples of how to bring together the scientific talent in both sectors around the same table, design what you know, the kinds of experiments that everybody wants answers to, insist the data has to be open access, and share the cost. And you can do things more, much more quickly that way. But it's a modest effort compared to the entire biomedical research enterprise. We're going to keep looking for things like that. I'd love to see one of those on schizophrenia, and I bet you would too, Herb Partis, because <laughs> the opportunities there also seem to be uh, kind of emerging as a way to capitalize on a lot of the amazing outpouring of basic science discoveries that are still trying to find their way into clinical applications. And together, we can probably do that better than separately. In terms of the overall enterprise, you mentioned that there are other places in the world that have read the American playbook, which is still the most successful in the world, but are trying to do something even more grand. This is the first year where we are not the nation that is spending the most on science and technology. China has surpassed us, not just as a percent of GDP, but in absolute dollars, with an enormous trajectory and an enormous intention uh, to overtake what has traditionally been our area of leadership in terms of development of new ideas, technologies, patents, and so on. And we celebrate that as long as it adds to the world's knowledge. But the consequences for America in terms of our ability to continue to recruit and retain the best and brightest to our workforce is not to be underestimated. So yeah, we are, thank you, Congress, We're doing a lot better than we were in 2015 when we had lost more than 20% of our purchasing power for research. But we have not entirely made that up yet. Um, we're hoping this upward trajectory, which has gotten started now and maybe about to hit its fourth year, will continue for a while longer because there's a lot of great science that we could be doing that we still can't afford to do. Amen. <laughs> uh, I too have enjoyed uh, this panel tremendously. Uh, so many great points. And Alfie, Duke Blue. I like your passion. <laughs> My question actually is to either Francis or the other Francis or any one of you about the other universe, which is artificial intelligence. Nobody said a word about them, oh, but in sure. fact, you know, if you think about what can we learn from them, or not them, but AI, and what can AI, what can AI learn from what you've learned in the brain science, and when you talk about singularity, you know, where is that going to go with regards to bringing all those research together, and perhaps this could be a very important tool that we can be using in the future. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Francis. Yeah, I'll I'll start. I uh, have recently been named to co-chair the government's uh, select committee on artificial intelligence with the head of DARPA. We have an all-agency approach. I've seen the uh, a draft of something that's going to come out um, universally, nationally, uh, very soon that will uh, be talking about just how important artificial intelligence is, not, not just for the subject matter that we're talking about, but overall subject matters. We all know lots of examples of where artificial intelligence has already benefited because of the big data, especially machine learning capabilities, but that's only one aspect of AI, has really benefited health outcomes. Uh, and in recent congressional testimony, in fact, I gave a couple of examples of that to do with septic shock in the brain and so forth. Um, just by young researchers putting together tremendous amounts of data and results and potential solutions uh, coming out of those and new approaches. So it's a, it's a tremendous new world. It's one that's very, very competitive with other countries putting a lot of money into. It's one of the many, many areas that we, we just definitely need to invest in. Invest in. Uh, quantum research is, of course, another one, and that's directly relevant to some biological principles. Uh, so overall, we, if, if we want to be a competitive, re retain our competitive status and be first among nations in many areas, we're just going to have to increase uh, our investment here. But AI, I'm glad you brought that up because we, we just didn't have a chance to touch on it is just one of those areas that offers tremendous potentials. And like any technology, it has its potential upsides, many, many benefits it could bring. And then it has its, uh, you know, its threats. And, and I think that's what's so interesting about this new world that we're all operating in and why we really need social and behavioral scientists um, to, uh, to, to help us on uh, assessing uh, threats, communicating uh, to the public what's at stake so that they can make good choices about uh, all of these things. So I think we only have time for one more question. I apologize for the 
a short amount of time. Um, I'm actually not seeing any hands. Are there any Can in the back? Just follow up on this. Oh yes. Question? So I think what's really interesting about this is these hybrid systems, right? This this thinking about how humans and AI are going to work together. And to some extent, this is where AI can learn from human cognition. Like, so what is it that the human brain actually does very well? And what are the things that it does not do well, like sustained vigilance, as probably most of us have experienced <laughs> sitting here today. Um, a drone and a robot would not have gotten bored or shifted in their seats or checked their emails or done anything else, right? So, so there are certain tasks that you really would love to have AI doing, right? Let's, let's have it do what humans don't do well, but let's preserve for humans what humans do well, um, so it's, which is dream and think about having new ideas and you know, collaborate and do all these wonderful things. I mean, so there are, there are types of problem solving for which I think AI is incredibly well designed. There are types of problem solving that the human brain is just really, really good at. How do we get those two systems to work together in a way that makes each better? I think that, that's an interesting challenge. Well, with that, we have to wrap up now. But thank you so much uh, for just making this a really compelling and awesome topic to discuss. And uh, thank you for the excellent questions. So. Thank you. Thank you.